Uh, my name is uh, Michael McFall. I'm the director here of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, big turnout. Um, uh, this is a joint collaboration of various different pieces of the center here of FSI in that our visitor, uh, President uh, Tomas Ilves, actually intersects with a lot of different uh, pieces that we do here. Uh, with CSAC, uh, given his interest in security and cybersecurity issues, uh, with the Center on Democracy Development and Rule of Law, given their interest in democracy, and the European, uh, the Europe Institute, given uh, the fact that you were the <laughs> you are a European uh, and a former president of of, of European countries. So um, I see a lot of faces here today that don't normally come to the meetings together, and that's really great. So uh, I'm glad we're doing this today. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in uh, things European, uh, we have a double uh, delight for you. Tomorrow at noon, uh, we'll have Alexander Stubb, who's here with us today, the former Prime Minister of Finland, a current Member of Parliament, and he'll be speaking on life after Trump and Brexit. Will Europe be able to take the lead? Uh, so that's tomorrow at noon. I know the event is sold out. Uh, but if you beg with Magdalena, who's somewhere here, right in the back, she might be able to get uh, some uh, special people in. Actually, I shouldn't say that. You probably can't. So never mind. <laughs> I shouldn't put her on the spot. But uh, come if you can. Uh, but please get permission first, because I know the event sold out. Um, all right. Uh, President Ilvis has been with us now for about three months or so. So... Uh, he is the inaugural Bernard and Susan Leotard Visiting Scholar uh, at, here at CSAC and, and with various affiliations throughout FSI. This fellowship, by the way, uh, Visiting Fellow, was designed specifically to bring people to Stanford right after they had finished a time in government. But there was another condition, that they had something intellectually to contribute to Stanford University. Um, and uh, I think we landed on the perfect first uh, Leotard Fellow, it uh, would be a very hard act to follow, uh, but do send your nominations in because uh, we'll be br bringing somebody next year as well. Um, uh, Pr President Elvis has had a long, interesting career, a kind of the career I'd like to have, frankly. Um, uh, I, I read today you're, you're going to go work for, for pro bono for the Senate. Correct. I volunteered to volunteer uh, to the Senate uh, in Intelligence Committee. They seem to be having trouble with staffers, so um, uh, I'd love to intern for free. We'll, we'll work for food, as people say. Um, he was the president of Estonia for 10 years, served two terms. Uh, prior to that, he had virtually every job one could have in the Estonian government, right? Except of interest. the prime minister. Except the prime minister. Okay, that's a pretty interesting job you didn't have. Uh, you know, your career's not over. Uh, but he was here as ambassador. He served as foreign minister. And um, as we're going to talk about today, um, uh, really, uh, both as a practitioner and now as a thought leader, is at the intersection of technology, democracy, and security, both uh, when he served as president uh, and now thinking about these issues in broad terms. So we're going to have a bit of a conversation, although it's going to be brief. Uh, from my part, we have a ton of expertise in the room just looking around. Um, so I'm going to start with a few questions, uh, unless you want to start with something. Do you want to start with something? Well, first? I'd like you to start. This, can you hear me? Okay. I'd like to start by thanking Donald Trump, uh, because uh, Donald Trump brought the three strands of my life together. Uh, since uh, as a child of refugees uh, who had fled from the Soviet Union, I was always, uh, from grade eight, I started reading the New York Times about about Russia or the Soviet Union, and later on that grew into an interest into, into democracy more broadly uh, when I was a teenager. And in between, I had this amazing serendipitous uh, uh, event in which I had a math teacher who once, for one semester only, taught a group of eighth grader, ninth graders to program which uh, meant that for my whole life I've been doing this, more or less, one way or another. So with, uh, with the election of 2006, we see democracy, uh, which is the main thing I'm going to talk about, being under threat, <clears throat> uh, thanks to new digital technologies that uh, haven't for at least the, the past 300 years of kind of electoral, liberal, democratic uh, 
well, electoral democracy, liberal democracy have not been employed. And then finally, of course, the fact that at least up till now, uh, Russia has been the country most involved in, in uh, getting at um, democracy. Though I would argue that there's no reason why other authoritarian governments cannot use exactly the same techniques that we saw last year here. And as we, if you follow the European news, is being done uh, constantly in Europe. Uh, just today there was another piece that uh, the same hacking group, APT28, also known as Fancy Bear, Sophocy, and Paw and All Things, or Pawn Storm, had managed to hack both the, Germ the, le the two leading German political think tanks, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, having already two years ago hacked into the entire German parliament. Um, and similarly, that uh, the this, this same group has actually been now doing uh, uh, setting up sites for spear phishing attacks on the Macron uh, team, though that had already been going on, but now this has been verified. So we're in this, um, uh, we're in a, I mean, I think we're in the beginning of a new phase in democracy because we have these, t these technologies that did not exist before um, that are being used to undermine uh, the way we do electoral democracy. Uh, and the responses to it, uh, I mean, there have been not been too many good responses to it, but at least one, uh, one worrisome uh, uh, tendency is that um, we may affect some of the other parts of uh, liberal democracy, that if we get the electoral part, sort of, we want to fix the electoral part with things such as, um, you know, fake news and uh, sort of Twitter bots that we may end up impinging on some other aspects of literal, liberal democracy such as uh, freedom of expression. And certainly you see movement in that direction with uh, March 15th, the uh, Justice Minister of Germany proposed some pretty draconian legislation on, on social media that uh, does not immediately take down uh, what is considered fake news. So, I mean, I think we're, all I can do is just sort of chart the landscape for you. Uh, the answers, I think, will take a long time to figure out, but it is, I mean, it is different from every election before, I'd say, 2016, the situation we're in. You could see it before coming here and there, but then you had to be paranoid. Uh, now, uh, you know, Sometimes the paranoids, in this ca these cases, the paranoids, in fact, are right. Uh, and I think we will have to really address this in the future in all liberal democracies. Uh, and in fact, uh, the only positive thing I can see is that maybe this might be, given the asymmetry of, the, of these attacks, they can do to liberal democracies, or authoritarian regimes can do to liberal democracies, but liberal democracies can't do back to them, uh, because... You know, they count the votes, so it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, and that may, in fact, cause lead liberal democracies to, to cooperate a little more against these threats. So, I mean, that's like my like abstract. Yep. I, uh, I want to get to the uh, typology, and I want to get to the prescriptions. We have till 1.30, so we can solve this problem by 1.30, okay? Um, but before we do so, I want to go back a little bit in history. Uh, I think when the definitive work on cybersecurity issues uh, has been written. It's, it, I hope it's being written right now at CSAC. Um, it'll start with 2007. It'll start with you uh, being attacked. Uh, I, I mean, maybe there's, you, you actually know the history, so inform us all about maybe there were other attacks that I don't know about, but most certainly that was a definitive moment in my understanding of these issues and thinking about these issues. Um, and I want to hear what it was like. Uh, tell us what happened, uh, how you responded, um, and what you did prescriptively moving forward as a country to prevent future attacks from Russia, and how worried should Estonians sh still be uh, of those kinds of attacks in the future. Okay, I, sort of, I'm just so for those of you who don't know, in 2007, uh, April, May, after the Estonian government decided to move a uh, Soviet statue that uh, was causing all kinds of problems 
um, we experience something called a DDoS attack, a, ma a massive DDoS. A DDoS attack is a distributed denial of service attack in which you overload servers so they can no longer respond. Um, that was nothing new. I mean, D DDoS attacks have taken place uh, have taken place for several years already. Uh, it was a means of extortion what, I mean, because you would um, uh, a, a small or medium-sized business that had, did its business on the web would then be attacked, and the server wouldn't work, so they wouldn't get any business, and then it was, they were extorted, kind of ten, twenty thousand dollars that you had to pay somewhat. Someone. The, the way these things work, just also it's important to know that, uh, to get a better handle on, is that it's done by the same, the same criminals who do spam. So when you get spam, um, you have these networks of, uh, of bots or robots, uh, robot computers, uh, which, which are basically your and mine and everyone else's computer if you've downloaded malware and then it's secretly under the control of some other people and they would send out Viagra ads. Um, and so, uh, or whatever, you know, the spam stuff. And then, um, but you can reverse the operation. You can, instead of sending it all, uh, shotgun style in all directions, you can, you can send them towards selected servers. It's the same mechanism, it's the same people. Now, what happened in 2007, as I said, was not new. It had been done before, but this was the first sort of Clausewitzian event in which it was no longer uh, a criminal action to gain, gain money, but rather it was a political act. So this was, and why Estonia stands out is, on the one hand, the fact that uh, this was all-encompassing. It hit government servers, it hit all of the newspapers that hit the banks, so effectively the country was kind of shut down, uh, or at least the critical aspects of our sort of functioning. Was, was shut it down. scary? Did it feel like, oh my God, the Russians are here? No, we didn't know it was the Russians. I mean, okay. we had no right. idea. What, first of all, it just, it's, I mean, I, I mean, when I remember when I, how I discovered it, I found that, okay, this site doesn't work, that site doesn't work. I called up our sysadmin, I said, my computer, or or do we have a problem? And we call back and said, everybody's got a problem. Uh, and so that was how we figured out that this was something big. It still took a little bit of time to figure out that it was not that a cable had been severed okay. or something. And then we then the and pretty quickly the the CERT or the Computer Emergency Response Team said we are under a DDoS attack. And so just to interrupt you because I'm I'm really interested in the de details. Who did you call? <laughs> Was it your IT guy? Well, the first guy calls me IT guy. All right, all right. Yeah. So, just like the rest of us, the president is calling his IT guy. Uh, okay. He answers quick, more quickly, or you get a, a quicker response than you do from the Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying too much. You're not the president. <laughs> well, yes. My wife says I'm not the president. Well, in any case, <laughs> I should point out my wife was the, the, was the uh, national director for cybersecurity for our neighbor, Latvia. So I know there is a priority. Big <laughs> <laughs> first. It, so, okay, I mean, so how long did it take you to figure out that it was the Russians? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, cause, uh, correlation is not causality, but there seemed to be a strong correlation between uh, Russian rhetoric and uh, and what we saw, uh, I mean the forensics, uh, the forensics on figuring out who who's done something is fairly difficult. The expert on on forensics for cyber attacks is here, Herb Lynn. I highly recommend his wonderful article in the uh, in the winter issue of the whatever it is, Journal, of International, Journal Affairs. of International Affairs. Right, very very good article because everyone always asks. Well, how do you know? And you see this right. even to this day. We don't know it's the Russians. We don't know it's the Koreans. Well, actually, you have a pretty good idea if you put all the evidence together, but, but no one's going to come out in a court of law on this. Anyway, so that happened. And uh, the interesting thing, which also gives you an insight into the way the Russians work, or other people could do it too, is that um, when, it was, uh, when it was all over, um, 
I went to the CERT to get an, a presentation of how they saw it. And what we saw on May 9th, which was then the anniversary of the, the Soviet-Russian anniversary of the end of World War II, um, you could see this sort of medium level of threat, and suddenly it spiked, and it went straight up, and then it continued, and then it dropped off. And I said, well, why is that not a normal Gaussian curve? Um, uh, with a normal district bell curve. And uh, they said, well, because the money ran out. And I said, what? And well, it turns out that what, the, I mean, this is how we figured out, or I figured out, how the other system worked. Is basically, you pay these criminal gangs, or organized crime gangs that do this illegal activity. And, uh, and, so, and then, so the attack started, the, the, the peak attack started at zero, 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 GMT and ended at 24,000 GMT. So, I mean, it was you just pay by the hour or you pay by the day. Um, and then, of course, this leads to, uh, which led to my next conclusion that, uh, that given this organized crime is paid for by, by the Russian government or some subset of it, that, that this gives a unique, uh, is a unique form of public private partnership. Um, <laughs> And that in Russia you don't have ISPs, you have, uh, uh, internet service providers, you have CSPs, criminal service providers. <laughs> so what was the response? What did you do to defend yourselves after that? Okay, well first, uh, there are a number of things that fell out of that. One, for one, since we had been already for three years, because in general Estonia is very developed in IT, and may have been one of the reasons why I think we were attacked because they thought, okay, this is, we can sort of do something to the reputation of this country that already then was known as kind of a digital pioneer. Uh, but we've been complaining for, or urging NATO for three years to deal with cyber issues, and they kept saying, ah, nah, nah, that's not really important. Um, and then when this happened, um, uh, in fairly short order, uh, NATO decided we will put a center of uh, cyber security, well, a center of excellence, actually, it's an academic institution in Thailand. We've ask, been asking for that. So that was one, one part of the fallout. Another thing that happened, which I have to commend uh, now your colleague here, I mean, within um, when the attack started, uh, like the next day, Condi Rice called me up hmm. and said, uh, you know, we're here, we're to help, can we do anything? And by the way, the next day the president, and tomorrow the president will call you. So then President George Bush called me up. Uh, again, the, I think the, it was the optics that was really important because he just said, I want you to come over to Washington. You know, it was basically in, you know, in four weeks. Go ahead and tell people that you're, you've been invited by me, which again raised the profile. And that's, you know, you know yourself. <laughs> as a diplomat, that the optics often actually does even more than what the reality of the, of the situation is. Uh, but I mean, it did really, it was the thing that focused NATO's attention much more on cyber issues and... But no discussion of Article 5, no, right? No, no, no. Just it, to be clear? No. I mean, that's, I mean, this is an unresolved issue to this day, you know, whether it counts. Uh, different countries in, within NATO have different approaches. Uh, the United States already said four years ago that it need not, need not answer in a, to a cyber attack in the same domain, meaning if cyber is a domain of warfare along with land, air, uh, sea, and space, if you attack the United States in cyber, the United States will attack you maybe some other way in response. The whole issue of what is a what is a proportional uh, response to a cyber attack has yet to be resolved. And that is one of the big conundra uh, that we face that, okay, I mean, if you, uh, you, if you take out a, uh, an electrical power plant with a missile, which you see on the radar, the missile comes and it hits it, and then you know where it came from, and you probably know who did it, and you know that, well, proportional would be to you know, take out uh, a similar thing. Whereas in a cyber attack, even though, as I said before, the forensics, you know, will ultimately <clears throat> allow you to, to, uh, to determine who did it, it can take a while because then you have to marshal all the resources, uh, both SIGINT and human intelligence to figure out where it came from. Um, and then what do you do in response to that is another thing. And so 
Uh, this does upset kind of the sort of standard view of things like <laughs> deterrence and so forth. Right. Uh, and there are two entire books that, uh, which have been produced now by the, uh, the NATO Center in Tallinn on uh, the application of, um, of international law and warfare and also on sort of non-warfare, but uh, two cyber attacks. And it is a huge area of contention, and there are there are <clears throat> protocols and conventions that can be applied, and there are others that can't be. And one of the big problems is that in this area we don't have uh, any kind of legal international legal framework that could be that would apply to the people that would do these things. Right. We have one thing which was originally called the Council of Europe. Uh, Convention on Cybercrime, because it was the <coughs> Council of Europe, but Strasbourg came up with it. It was rapidly acceded to by Japan, the United States, Mexico, Canada, all these countries that are not in the Council of Europe for obvious reasons. But it, uh, it is a convention that obligates then those who have acceded to it to, to um, extradite people uh, to, I mean, if someone is a cyber criminal and has committed a crime, say, from Estonian territory against the United States, we would then hand that person, I mean, the U.S. would say, this guy did it, we'd go arrest him, then we'd extradite him to the United States, and this has actually happened a number of times, I mean, most recently with a Russian hacker in Canada. But uh, we've extradited people, Latvia has extradited people, and uh, they're often surprised because the U.S. Uh, sentences are rather draconian versus what European ones. But the problem is that people who actually most of the time do this uh, live in countries that have not acceded to this convention. The convention is now called the Budapest Convention, as I think I said, because it now is worldwide, but unfortunately it does not have <clears throat> Russia, Belarus, maybe Ukraine has acceded to it uh, since uh, 2014, but before that it was another major source of of both cyber crime and cyber attack, and of course the People's Republic of China. All of those countries uh, remain outside that framework, uh, yet being the main primary sources of these kinds of these criminal acts, um, the legal framework doesn't help us right. much. So uh, all these questions are, are a, a prelude to talking about 2016, because there's a case study, and I, I want people to understand the case study before we get to our elections. What did you do to protect um, your systems, your computers, after this attack? And what, what could you do legally? Were there issues, I mean, kind of getting back to the things you alluded to, um, uh, in terms of enhancing cybersecurity for Estonia? Well, first of all, let me just tell you one thing. Because everyone says, oh, they, they were, Estonians were the first to be hacked. No, we, the, a DDoS attack does not get into anything. Right, right. So that means it, it just stops everything. It just stops you from ex accessing your, your right. whatever it is you want, your bank, your, your newspaper, the government site. Um, well, we, we, did, we did set up sort of cooperation with a number of countries. We already had a little bit, but it wasn't advanced enough uh, because we had... Um, we had prepared just before this uh, this incident to uh, for a potential DDoS attack because we had ha we had uh, had our first electronic voting. Uh, yeah, I wanted voting. to ask you about that. So yeah. and so we one of the things one of the scenarios we thought of was that there was, someone might attack actually that server, and so we set up some cooperation with the Czechs and the Slovenes and a couple of other countries um, that we could mirror these. Uh, so that you know, meaning that you could still access the site even though the the server in question is under attack. Okay. Um, but um, we did that in a much bigger way after the attack, and set up much stronger cooperation, which uh, managed to pay off for Georgia a year later, when the same, uh, I mean, in a more advanced form of the same kind of cyber attack took place. Because there it was that it became hybrid. Because what happened in uh, Georgia, and you can read about this in two successive uh, issues of the Small Wars Journal from about 2011, I think, um, they would blank out an area with, with the DDoS attacks and then bomb it. 
So you would increase the kind of Clausewitzian fog of war because not only would you, I mean, you would not know what's happening, you couldn't access anything to find out what's happening, and then you would be bombed or shelled, I don't know which one it was. Uh, uh, and by that time, what we were doing, you know, when as soon as the, we, the Georgians saw that this was happening to their sites, we then started mirroring the Georgian sites to, uh, to get over this. DDoS attacks, I would just say that you know, the, um, back then were done by bots of computers that had been taken over by uh, criminal gangs um, you know, and people who, un who downloaded bad material. Basically porn sites are the main source of, of that kind of malware. It has gotten much worse um, since then in a big leap that thanks to the development of the Internet of Things. Uh, and all of the, all these closed circuit television cameras, refrigerators, you know, your Amazon Echo or whoever does it. All of those things are so-called IoT devices. They're machines talking to machines. The problem with these machines, at least as they are, these devices when they're sent out, is that um, they have, uh, their passwords are usually things like 12345 or 000. Um, they're not well protected. And last October, um, we saw a massive increase in the level of DDoS attacks when um, with something called the Mirai attack, in which someone, uh, first of all, some group, managed to get a huge, huge number of IoT devices, so which were, I mean, they're basically, they really are robots. They're not even, down, it's not downloaded malware, they were just hijacked. Uh, we're, first of all, increasing the number of attackers dramatically, but moreover, F uh, fixed on a, a, a genuine node, the company DYN, the, which is a DNS company, does the basically the DNS, the sort of the domain name server. Uh, is the, one of those nodes where when you type in Stanford.edu, that company changes the number into the 12 digit um, code that actually is your domain. And so what happened was that uh, there is this company in New York, it employs about 500 people. Um, it's called DYN. And you can look it up. It's Mirai, M-I-R-I-A-I, -I -I the, was the attack. And basically by attacking this little node, which, all, I mean, it's, it's a company that simply changes names into numbers uh, to direct your internet traffic, that went down, and large parts of the United States and Europe were without coverage, thanks to that node being attacked. Uh, and here again, this is this is a step beyond first because it's you have far more attackers because every every little machine that hasn't been properly passworded can be hacked, and moreover, they they looked at a, a key node that would take out a huge swath, as opposed to say focusing on you know, my bank in Estonia, which is kind of doesn't really, only affects me and a couple other people. Well, that gets, I, I've only on my second question, by the way, so I'm, gonna, I'm only going to go to my third one and then I'll open it up. Uh, but still back on uh, in, to Estonia before we get to 2016 here um, and your typology of different instruments of interference. Um, you know, the, there's the dual sides of technology, which I've heard you talk about before, uh, and the, we're not we're not spending much time today talking about the virtues of technology and and the the amazing things that you you have done and your country has done, um, but but the the edge I, I think for you know just listening to you talk is about voting and tell us a little bit about what you think are the virtues of the way that Estonians vote and tell people why they shouldn't be concerned that uh, Estonian voters might have a greater risk of having their votes somehow manipulated because of what you've done? Well, <coughs> this is a whole lecture. But I know. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, Estonia, Pretend you're on Twitter. Estonia, <laughs> I mean, it's digital voting. It is not going to an electronic machine and pushing a button. It is based on, first of all, the... the uh, the very strong identification system we have, which is a chip card, uh, which allows you to do two-factor authentication. 
um, and you can all, and also the back end architecture, which allows you only to get to your uh, to your to you. That is to your data, your little cell, and so the two things are uh, that normally people are afraid about uh, is that one is you can't sort of hack a password and get in. Uh, you can only do it with uh, through a very high level of security identification. And secondly, once you get in, higher than at Stanford, right? You told me much higher. <laughs> we let's not talk about Stanford. Like, oh, keep going, keep going. No, it's just a, we, the system that Stanford uses is uh, we in Estonia call we don't call two factor authentication. We call one point five factor authentication. Okay. Uh, you. Because you get it over your you get it over your. Uh, Completely hackable cell phone. I mean, so it's not really, it's like it is an additional factor, but it doesn't really give you that much. If someone really wants to get you, they can, in fact, uh, eavesdrop on your cell phone. So it's not, a, it's not that secure. Okay. Um, there but, are people that really want to get me. Uh, so you're not making me feel better. <laughs> Keep going. I should just add that Stanford shouldn't feel bad because I read two days ago that the U.S. <laughs> Congress has ID cards um, uh, with a with a chip, except it's not really a chip, it's a sticker that looks like a chip. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So it looks like they're really up to date and modern, but they don't have two-factor authentication of the type that for US government offices now have, but it's really, you look hip and cool. It's <laughs> Didn't know that. So anyway, um, so you get on, you get on, you vote. Um, uh, so if you were, I mean, in order to sort of really do the election, you have to get everybody individually, which is rather hard, especially with two-factor authentication. Right now, for the past four elections, about 31, 32, 33% of the, of the electorate votes online. Uh, why do people do it? Well, I mean, first of all, you manage to get people who are abroad. I mean, Catherine is lucky to come from such a big country that uh, you, they actually have a, France as a, as a polling station, but I mean, if you're Estonian, it's not so easy. Um, or I even know that uh, one of the, the former CEO of Skype told me about how he was sitting with his Finnish friend, and, and Finnish and Estonian elections are always within a week of each other, and so Estonian goes, well, I guess I'll vote, and the other guy said, and he voted, and the other guy said, I have to drive down to LA if I want to vote, I, don't bother, I won't bother. Uh, anyway, so that it, that's how it works. I mean, you log on, you vote, and with the way it works also to avoid some of the problems is that people can conjure up is that you can change your vote um, because they said, well, what? Because as opposed to a polling place, what happens if you're voting home? Someone comes with a gun and says, you will now vote for that person. Well, you can later go change your vote, uh, and also if even if that happens at the last minute, you can always go to the polling station and that voids your earlier vote. Um, the interesting thing about the, uh, the, the we have a we have a sociology of a sort of IT behavior sociologist of IT behavior, so and he studied these now for six elections. Uh, initially, people thought that they would be urban, younger, and more sort of left. Well, left liberal would be the right word. Uh, but after three elections, it all evened out. So basically, uh, left, right, urban. Rural, young, old, there really are, it's, it's a flat curve and has been for three elections, which I think comes from the basic penetration of IT and society in this general use, so that it, it mirrors the society pretty well uh, when it comes to elections. Um, I mean, it's one of many things that we offer in Estonia, uh, which is part of my bigger spiel saying that if you want to, if you want to develop a digital society, you have to focus um, not on the things that most governments want, which is the Ministry of Finance saying we can tax you better, but rather on services that people like. So, you know, voting, uh, we have digital, sig uh, digital signatures, which you can do all kinds of legal documents, which is a big thing. Uh, digital prescriptions, so that you don't, go to, you don't have to go see your doctor, at least for refills. But even the Gosia doctor, he puts it in the computer, and you can now, then you can go to any pharmacy to get it. And most importantly, I would say it's a huge step, even though it's um, not getting much press, but 
uh, in the first time ever that there is any kind of interoperability in digital services between countries is uh, that Estonia and Finland are going to have a mutually uh, mutually interoperable digital prescription so that get 8 million Finns coming a year, and they're always having a good time in Taiwan because it's much more interesting, and they're always losing the <laughs> No, 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 the booze, the booze is cheaper. <laughs> so that is much more interesting. <laughs> He's humble, that was actually his initiative, not the booze bit, but uh, they interpreted it. Well, it was a long initiative. The problem is this is something which technologically was possible 30 years ago, but it's, but uh, when I proposed it five years ago, it's only now that it's coming in. It's true. Um, but at least that's, I mean, ultimately I would see all of Europe working this way. This right. I mean, that would be how the European Union should function, that public services such as prescriptions, legal signature, all these things are mutually interoperable across borders. Unfortunately, right now, Europe is the opposite, which is that physical goods, people, capital, services, uh, physical services, can move across borders, but digital services with huge difficulty, and that's what, you now with this little promo for Estonia, I mean, our presidency is starting on July 1, and our whole thing is promoting the digital single market agenda, but that's... Well, so let me ask one last question, and then I'll open it up uh, to anything, by the way. This is a, a Ask Me Anything kind of Reddit session. <laughs> Um, I'm going to skip my questions about populism in Europe. Maybe we'll talk about those tomorrow. Um, and ask you instead about America and um, our elections. Um, you arrived here right at the time that all of these issues became uh, very germane for most Americans who hadn't thought about them. Uh, correlation is not causation. I think you said that earlier today. But Possession is not correlation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or the other. But tell, just, you know... Riff a little bit on what you've observed, what you think is going on. Uh, tell us your best guess of what the Russians have done, what they intended to do. Um, and then if we have time, you know, maybe a little bit about prescriptions. But, you know, just your general impressions. Well, of first, I think there, there are so many misconceptions uh, about what is going on that, I, I mean, at least I, I try uh, the paper just to sort of do a typology of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, place to start. I mean, so the term hacking an election is a useful metaphor but it is not it does not describe anything i mean there are m numerous mechanisms some of which uh, i don't think anyone even understands quite yet at least i try and don't but uh, first of all i mean hacking is the most basic thing of going into a computer uh, and this is what happened to the democratic national committee we hear from the fbi director that they also went into the RNC or the Republican National uh, Committee, um, the difference between the two gives rise to the next mechanism, which is doxing, which is a term that came from the WikiLeaks, uh, WikiLeaks seven, eight years ago, um, in, in which you publish documents. And this is where there is a difference between what happened to the Democrats and the Republicans was that if they said, Comey said they went into both servers, uh, both group servers, um, they only published and stole, I mean stole and published the material from the Democratic server. Um, and so, I mean, that which did a huge amount of damage to the Clinton campaign. Uh, already hacking into a computer like that is not something one should do. Uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I say basically it is it is equivalent to the 1972 June break-in of, the, of again the Democratic National Committee uh, in the Watergate Hotel. The difference is that that was physical. The people were caught, um, uh, which ultimately led to the resignation of the president. Uh, but the thing that amazes what is different today is the sociology or psychology of the media, which I mean. If you steal the physical correspondence of a political party, as, as was attempted to do in 1972, that would, there would have been universal condemnation and really people would not have looked at what, what is in that. Uh, the media response, and I think the New York Times even regrets it, to the theft of, I mean, they're purloined letters. I mean, to use the sort of, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, I think. Right? I mean, 
They are stolen, and then they are published. And instead of going, wow, look at this, people have stolen the correspondence of a political party and being aghast at that, they, uh, with, uh, with this, this vulgar voyeurism, instead focus on the content of that rather than the fact that, how did this happen? That, you know, and why are we even discussing this? And, you know, if that doesn't help, then think about having your own email hacked and then looking for something that could really be embarrassing to someone and then having... And the fact was huge. I mean, the, uh, the, the chairman resigned um, as a result of, you know, she had made some comments about uh, Sanders. I mean, who of us has not said something nasty about someone else? A third person in our e in a, in our emails, which are stored on a server that may be hacked into. Um, so I mean, that's the, so. First, you have hacking, then you have doxing. I mean, you add to that fake news, uh, which is again, I mean, in and of itself, is nothing new. I mean, uh, you know, the Trojan horse was fake news because um, <laughs> they said we went away, but they didn't go away. Um, and we're leaving you this gift. But what is, um, but as a, the prominence of fake news, of lies, thanks to this new uh, digital environment of Facebook uh, and Twitter, um, the problem that we face is that it has completely changed our consumption of news, or they have. Um, the Pew, is always doing these studies, uh, found that l last June that 62% of Americans, for 62% of Americans, the primary source of news is Facebook. So, I mean, it may be the New York Times or it may be, you know, Breitbart or whatever it is, but you're getting it all from, or at least 62% of Americans are getting it from pr primarily from Facebook. Uh, and on the other side, in addition to Facebook, there's Twitter, where you have these, um, we have Twitter bots that, you know, d just constantly repeat certain certain uh, items so that uh, two different followers or non-followers. Uh, and the, the the big researcher on this, by the way, is a I understand from you is the star of the Stanford baseball team. Uh, basketball, 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 not very right, basketball. Uh, Kate Starbird, who's at the University of Washington, but is doing superb work, and I hope you invite her here sometime. On um, no, take on how uh, how uh, how fake news uh, is spread, and she has a piece, a uh, really good piece on Medium.com from about a month ago on how she started researching this when she was looking at how man news of man-made disasters spread. And, just this, and she took as a case study the Boston Marathon bombing, and she studied what, you know, and she discovered that all these bizarre conspiracy theories were, arose immediately, rather, um, I mean, saying that Navy SEALs did it, you know, and it was even when they'd arrested sort of two Chechens and so forth. But, and how then this, but this spread massively across the Twitter sphere. Uh, and that's when she discovered that these that there are these politically motivated Twitter bots or politically managed Twitter bots that spread conspiracy theater uh, theories or or theories that things didn't happen. Um, uh, and so this is this is I mean these things go viral. Uh, the most recent one she looked at was the Syria hashtag here Syria hoax, which again went viral. Uh, claiming that no sarin gas or sarin attack had occurred. Um, and so this then becomes a trending topic on Twitter, and then people who are silly enough to look at what's trending will retweet it, and it just turns into an avalanche. So the third aspect is sort of social media. Um, uh, through social media, the um, truth becomes... Devalued. Uh, there's a wonderful book which I would urge, even for entertainment value, to read, <clears throat> which is by a man named Peter Pomerantsev. It's called uh, "Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible" about his experiences in Russia as a television producer, which is from about ten years ago, but it applies today. 
And at the central sort of eminence glee there is, um, is uh, Surkov, the sort of the, the sort of, I don't know what you call him, kind of the, uh, not the great cardinal, we call him the Wizard of Oz. And bizarrely enough, the new administration decided that he will be the interlocutor for, for future discussions with Russia. But anyway, how he runs the entire media of Russia and how you know, you're told don't do this. We saw the same thing happen. We saw it, sort of the real explosion of fake news uh, with the Ukrainian um, invasion of Ukraine. Before that, there had been a lot of disinformation being spread about sort of within, I mean, within Russia, and then uh, in Eastern Europe. But oh, by, during the Georgian War, we saw a lot of that. But where it really took off was the Ukrainian invasion, when in fact the Western media was inundated with fake news, which were then naively enough in the beginning picked up by Western news sources. Saying, "Well, we want to have an advance, I and mean, we want to balance pictures. So you have a you know a lie about the Ukrainians crucifying a, a little boy, and then you know the Ukrainians saying no, and well, and then you have the BBC." saying, well, we have to present both sides. They've calmed down a bit on that, and they realize that there is such a thing as fake news. So, I mean, that's it. The, the, all three that I mentioned are already new developments. Um, now, where, where it gets really uh, scary to my mind, uh, but I don't know quite the mechanism yet, is that big data and analytics has gone to the point where you can you can in the political <coughs> process you can basically dispense with mass communication um, that um, uh, there is a company called Cambridge Analytica that does big data analytics and based on whatever you feed into it, it uh, um, you can pinpoint very specifically very in a very granular way uh, your audience and tell your messages to them. And uh, Cambridge Analytic is a company that was, first of all, his major investor is one of Trump's biggest supporters, Robert Mercer, and along with his wife. And, um, and uh, Steve Bannon is on the board uh, of this company. And, um, uh, and its CEO uh, broadcasts, I mean, sort of gives uh, talks about how, how good. Uh, how well one can, in fact, go and uh, send mess target messages, very simple. I'm thinking if I can find the quote somewhere here, because I mean, they, you know, they say it outright. Now, the question we haven't really figured out is how much of this is uh, self-promotion and how much of it is really true. Uh, but in any case, big data analytics uh, can, in fact, uh, target, um, target things target audiences in a way that, you know, you, you live on that block, you know, you are, you are this ethnicity, you seem to be of this, you know, income range, I will, you have a message that goes. Um, well, here's the quote from Alexander Nix, who's the CEO. A really ridiculous idea, the, the idea that all women should receive the same message because of their gender, or all African Americans because of their race. That is, they, uh, they, what they sell is targeting very specific messages. Um, the question is, you have to know who, who you have to target. And this, I, for me at least, raises a suspicion on one of the other um, ra rather unreported sides of, the, uh, of Russia's uh, efforts last year, which is that the voting rolls in a number of, country, in a number of states uh, were stolen by the Russians, the same group, APT28 or Fancy Bear, broke into certain state governments and, or, and stole the voting rolls. Now, why would you do that? Because you, you can't really affect the vote. I mean, you can't, I mean, they're not, you can't change their vote. But why would you want to know who's, who's, who's voting if not for use in targeting specific voters? So when you put all of this together, um, I mean, aside from being very depressing, is that um, that the way we do electoral democracy today, um, I mean, we do it the old way, and it. Uh, but we have to understand that these we are facing the kind of threats uh, to the process that we could not imagine, um, sort of say, ten years ago, uh, or you could imagine, but you had to have a pretty wild imagination. 
Uh, and so how do we proceed? Um, and I think one of the things that worries me is that some of the responses at least could, on the other hand, could in turn undermine the democratic process or liberal democracy as we know. Because, I mean, when you see, you see a country like Germany, which really takes a very hard line on all kind of extremism, and especially right-wing extremism, um, having been uh, subjected to fake news from Russia, and this year there was even a fake news story broadcast by Breitbart, which said that a thousand, completely false, claiming a thousand Muslims on New Year's Eve had burnt down Germany's oldest church. And when, when they see that, then they see the reactions of the German public and the sort of the rise of a hardcore uh, right-wing party, Allianz for Deutschland, they go. We're not going to allow. We're not going to allow Nazis to come back. I mean, they're far more hardcore about this than anyone else. I guess they've been fairly well denazified compared to some other countries. So, I mean, there is an it is anathema to them, and so the responses may not always be so sort of Anglo-Saxon liberal democratic as we might think, because in fact, they said the German Ministry of Justice has proposed a law that would uh, that would levy up to. Uh, 50 million dollar euro fines, at least 55, 55 million dollars for any fake news that is not removed immediately, um, <clears throat> which of course scares the hell out of companies like, uh, well, <laughs> Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but that's one, one possible response, at least to part of the, these scourges. What other things that you can do and should do is that uh, when I mentioned two-factor <coughs> authentication before, uh, David Sanger in the New York Times said that of the 128 people with access to the servers of the DNC, 126 used two-factor authentication. Guess, <laughs> guess who they got? Those two that did not use two-factor authentication. Wow. Not that two-factor authentication is, I mean, sort of will give, give you ultimate safety, but it raises the threshold for breaking in substantially and is something that um, everyone should use, but you should use a better system than what you have here. <laughs> so that's a good place to open it up. Yeah, Herb. And if you could uh, identify yourself, because we have a, a mixed crowd here, not everybody may know everybody, so. Okay. Uh, Herb Lynn, CSAC, I do cyber stuff here. Um, so, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, on the following proposition, that it seems that the, that the sort of propaganda, information warfare kind of, of, of stuff uh, enacting against elections is going to have small, so, so it seems like it has relatively small effects, but of course in a closely divided electorate, small effects have big consequences. Uh, and so what I was wondering is whether you've ever looked at, or is anybody looking at, different, uh, different architectures for voting, in with proportional voting or whatever, that may give you more robustness against this kind of attack, where, uh, where a winner-take-all because of a small shift in, 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 in voting doesn't, doesn't result in a skewing of the electoral will. Well, do the first. Of all, I mean, some effects can be huge. That a fake news story can lead some wacko to actually believe that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta are running a, a, a pedophile ring in a, in a peanut pizzeria and goes at, after it with a with an automatic weapon. Yes. So I mean, the effects can locally can be devastating. Yes. Um, well, I mean, one solution, which um, I mean, is that um, you have multiple mandates. Um, multiple mandate electoral districts, because what you have in the U.S. and, well, in Anglo-Saxon countries, you have uh, you have a first-past-the-post single mandate uh, system, so that if you win, I mean, it's winner-take-all, and these systems inevitably lead to a two-party system, and so you can have these Yes, no, or I mean, in the case of referenda, yes, no answers, or in the case of an election, you end up with two parties, and so you get dramatic shifts. Whereas the standard European parliamentary system tends to be a multiple mandate system, where you then, using some calculus like the De Hunt method, you sort of calculate who gets how many votes weighted. 
Um, but it does lead to more parties and an effort to, you end up having to form coalitions, which tends to kind of, they tend to gravitate toward the center, and they tend to sort of calm the waters a bit, whereas uh, if you have, when you have first past the post, winner take all elections, you end up with, uh, you can end up with some um, fairly uh, radical changes. And those this way, first past the post, at least, does not, um, <clears throat> inculcate necessarily a sense of cooperation, whereas uh, m when you have um, multiple mandate systems, you then you end up with like three parties or four, five parties. No one has enough to form a majority, and then you have to form a coalition, and that sort of you even have like in Finland you have this what was a very hardcore right of center party, sort of anti-European and so forth call themselves the true Finns, end up being kind of a, you know, well, a conservative right of center, but not so bad at all party. Mm -hmm. And now almost extinct. Well, that's what happens to those parties in those systems. So back here, and then to the Prime Minister. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, Jack and Kerr, um, I, from Lawrence Livermore National Lab in CSAC. Um, two questions. The first one is, um, Looking at the uh, Estonian attack in 2007, um, to what extent did you see other sorts of operations? Like, um, I, I know I've seen references to Nochnoi Dozor and other groups that seem to have Russian involvement that were not cyber do, or involved see. cyber, or used trolling and things like that. To what extent was this a multi-pronged attack, not just a cyber attack? And then the second question is, um, I wrote my dissertation on the evolution of authoritarian approaches to control over the internet within their territory and uh, then got involved in studying cybersecurity and my worlds have obviously collided here. Um, and one of the concerns I've had watching the fake news story develop is how does this not become a slippery slope to some of the things you were talking about in Germany? And um, either something where it's being decisions made behind closed doors in corporate headquarters or decisions made behind closed doors in government headquarters. Do you have any ideas of best practices of how to have a better sort of maybe uh, multi-stakeholder or some sort of uh, engagement in that process of thinking through those solutions? Two questions. Well, Two giant hard questions, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I mean, well, uh, I mean, clearly authoritarian governments have tried to impose their regimes internationally in the ITU. Uh, the ITU, I guess, four years ago, was a big battle between liberal democracies uh, in the UN versus then the authoritarian regimes uh, that were sort of wanted to impose a kind of a global order on on uh, the content of the web. So this was, or so you wouldn't have you wouldn't have criticism of say Putin appear in the web outside of Russia as well, and and that was pushed back. But it, it took a considerable amount of effort to push that back. Um, I'm not sure the ITU is the proper forum for actually doing doing internet stuff uh, because it used to be the International Telegraph Union. It's a real bad case of mission creep, I think. Um, on um, well, I mean, the regulation of the internet uh, is something that is uh, it's not gone anywhere. It can go in so many directions, in bad ways and good ways. Um, and there are several steps that I think that should be taken, um, not necessarily completely related to what you said, but there's another news story today, for example, about a company that scours your, uh, scours your, um, your emails to find references to Lyft, which they then sold to Uber. Um, basically, I think we need to go over to a model where you own your personal data whatever it is. Uh, we don't have that anywhere right now. Well, when you study, you own your personal data if it's stored on uh, sort of, uh, I mean, if it's health care or something, or sort of those things. But uh, the, the commercial relationships you have, um, all the apps um, that you have, I mean, they're basically monetizing you. I mean, if you actually believe that you have a free app that someone has made because they're good Samaritans and want to contribute to the world. No, I mean, they are, those apps are there to, to monetize your data, whatever it may be, whatever they may be. Um, so that's one area. I mean, the content of news is a whole other area. This is one of the, I mean, the, 
Facebook continues to say that they are simply a platform, not a media company. I would go further, and perhaps I would go further, and I have to think this through. But maybe it's a utility, because you had you had uh, you know you had railroads and elect electrical companies doing all <laughs> kinds of things that I mean they, with massive market domination until the government finally about 110 years ago said, wait a minute. We have to regulate you because there's no competition in this area, and essentially there is no competition to Facebook. Um, so that's another area. I think that you do need to have an ID. Uh, I mean, uh, and you do need to have a strong identity online. Um, and there, the problem is that uh, the the Anglo-Saxon countries, also known as the Five Eyes, are the ones most opposed to any kind of genuine identity. Um, but without that, the current system which we have, or which everyone uses, which is, you know, your, which is your email at the domain, you know, Stanford, top domain, edu, plus a password, uh, worked fine when 3,500 academics used BitNet in the 1980s. Um, in, there are 3.5 billion people on the internet today. Uh, you cannot use that system for, and be secure, and it's just ridiculous. So you need to have a strong identity, but the op political opposition to that is huge. Can I just ask a quick follow-up question? Um, uh, where do you come down on the the self-regulation versus the utility threat uh, for these companies? Because obviously, the First Amendment issues are, are legal ones, but uh, commercial ones they have a different set of standards. Nobody, uh, you know, you could change the business model where you you are much more interventionary and maybe save yourself from becoming a utility. Uh, because if you don't do that, one could argue that that will be your fate and you'll have a lot less freedom to maneuver. So should there be uh, uh, the norms of the valley that they, they come together and talk about these things? And, and maybe censorship is too uh, big a word, but, but what about more minimally, thinking about our elections, for instance, just the um, more information about the source. So. Sputnik, for instance, is a government source. Uh, should your viewers, if you're a Facebook customer, have the right to know that that's funded by the Russian government, or is that a bridge too far? Well, I think that's reasonable. I mean, first of all, just with to back up. I mean, I really do think that a lot of the a lot of the problems that I mentioned um, in terms of data going out. I mean, you don't need government intervention. You just you just say, you just, except for a law saying that you own your own data, and you can sell it. I mean, in fact, right. I think it would be a great way to, for people to make money. And, you know, it, might be, it wouldn't be universal basic income, but, but I mean, be, but it would be a way to, you know, you sort of say, okay, I'll let, uh, you know, I'll let Uber or I'll let anybody sort of monitor, you know, I download this and, I, you know, I get my, you know, three dollars a month or something, and you have a lot of apps, and you can make money that way. Right. Uh, that's no problem. But, um, but the problem, the issue is that when it's done anyway without your knowledge, you don't know what's being taken. And of course, this case, which just uh, came, is in today's New York Times, I think. Um, think about these companies that is actually data mining you, and then say, you know, the PRC buys the company. I mean, what does that mean? That means your data are being mined by a foreign government. I mean, we paranoid Estonians think about this all the time. What happens if this company, that, you know, this internet service provider that has a monopolistic role, uh, decides that, well, you know, we've got such a great offer that we'll just sell ourselves to, you know, the, to the FSB, right? I mean, this is... These are issues that we haven't looked at. I mean, this is, it's bad enough what's happening. We don't know yet what could happen, but we need to think about the future. Alexander. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Alexander Stubb, uh, former Prime Minister of Finland, but more importantly, former colleague in the European Parliament with Thomas Ilves. That's where we met about, I don't know, 15 years ago. So I'm thinking, thank you very much. I think it's been very fascinating. We're actually talking about two very positive things, democracy and technology. But if you note, we're only talking about the negatives of those two things. So I was wondering whether you could reflect a little bit about the positive aspects that technology will have on democracy in terms of how it will change uh, representative democracy into more direct democracy, what this will mean to come European or uh, U.S. governments, and not only 
through fake news or through hacking or through doxing, but the opportunities that you've had, for instance, in Estonia. So what will European democracy look like after the technological revolution and anyone can have their say at any particular moment? Because it has to be something positive about it as well. Okay, well, I would start by saying the negative was basically the last thing you want to do is get rid of uh, representative democracy in favor of digital voting because you will end up, because who passes laws? I mean, laws are a long grinding thing, and we've both been in several parliaments. And if you end up having, uh, you know, a, a new pharmaceuticals law, and instead of having representatives voting on sort of, you know, sort of section 8, paragraph 32, yeah. Um, you just and the pharma company sees, oh, this is going to be, this is going to give us more money. Why don't we just pay a hundred people extra to vote online? So you don't want to do that. Uh, this was a positive approach. No, that was a, a, a positive thing. I'll give you two cases. One of them, which is the empowerment of civil society, that in an experiment that, or it was an experiment, it started in Estonia, is now spread to a hundred countries, which was that in Estonia we have. I mean, as I discover here in the United States, or in Palo Alto, where I can't throw anything out because it's not the right size. For the, um, you know, cardboard. I mean, it's like I spend my Tuesday nights cutting up cardboard. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the free world. Yeah. But people, uh, people don't like this, and so they just go and chuck garbage. And so what happens is you have this countryside littered with garbage, piles of garbage. And so there have been sort of cleanup campaigns ever since, I don't know when, but in 1970, uh, Earth Day, I was 15, and I went around sort of collecting garbage in my little town in New Jersey. Uh, but they never really worked. So what happened was that these two guys from Skype actually invented an app to download on your smartphone that would geolocate uh, a picture of a pile of garbage. And then this was all fed into a sort of master computer that then looked at where they are, and then figured out how many people were needed for each spot. And then there was another, uh, there was another, there's a, a, a digital logistics company that actually generally figures out what's the best way for trucks in Europe and in India and Argentina and Mexico, it turns out, to go from one place to another. Um, and they did a free, a free logistical program or pro bono, which then would that sent the garbage trucks to pick up. So the, on the cleanup day, Everyone went to their assigned place, cleaned the stuff up, put it into bags, and then the garbage trucks would come at a certain time and everyone would throw it in. You can read all about it. It's called Let's Do It World, in one word, .org. It started in Estonia, and now it's, I think, 107 countries around the world, regardless of regime, by the way. Uh, I mean, even Russia and China have done it, though I would say there was one East European country in the European Union that was so suspicious of this sort of uh, <clears throat> citizen initiative that they were tracking them and saying this was, you know. So that's one example of how you can dramatically increase uh, citizen participation in, um, citizen participation in civil society <coughs> that actually do a job that no government could do, which is clean up sort of the countryside. The other thing that was a one-off that uh, we had, that I faced, a, where we um, we had a lot of, I mean, at one point the government became, I mean, did various things that upset a lot of people and had all these kind of civil society protests, and it was, it was really basically parliamentary democracy versus civil society. Um, and so I called the various people together and I said, well, you know, what are we going to, how are we going to get out of this mess because you all hate each other and... Uh, and then one side said, well, we have these problems, the other side, we have these problems. And the way we then proceeded was mm, using our ID cards. We allowed all, all residents of Estonia who had an ID to write in saying what are the problems they think are the problems. And so we, got, uh, we did it with their ID cards so you don't get trolls. Everyone has to, has to do this. To be serious, you do it under your own name. And then we had the uh, political science department of the university, and we gave a little work to academics, uh, to sift through these thousands of things to kind of put them into broad categories, and basically they narrowed it down to about seven categories. And then we did, using that great Stanford faculty member, um, Fishkin's deliberative democracy approach, and we then sort of invited a sample of about a thousand people all together to do a deliberative democracy exercise based on the seven questions that we had, the academics had filtered out. 
Uh, and in fact, some of the stuff was actually, I mean, we ended up with some very counterintuitive results, which were positive. Uh, uh, from that, uh, I then proposed four legislative changes, at which were then, of which one was passed, and it was the worst because they wanted to reduce the threshold for party membership to a very low number, with the result that a hardcore right-wing party managed to register as a, as a, as a party, um, and they were elected into parliament. Um, and so it all started out very nicely, but the end result was a disaster. Another positive story. Yes, please. And I, have, I can't see people over there, so raise your Wait, hand. Wait, let me just finish that. But I oh, think, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Me, I'm but sorry. for the European Union, if, I th if it's going to work, if it's going to offer something to citizens, then those digital services that people just love in Estonia and bemoan uh, their absence elsewhere, saying, my God, how primitive. I mean, you know, <laughs> I have these people come here to go, checks? What are checks? Mm -hmm. I mean, not to mention all these services with digital prescriptions, digital signatures, di I mean, sort of um, tax, uh, online, real-time taxation for corporations, all these things. That, I mean, we have it in Estonia. I mean, I think what we will end up doing it is sort of slowly building these things on for Finland, because that's who's interested a little bit, and then we'll maybe do it with Latvia and Lithuania. But the point is, if you're going to be, what you, the goal should be that if you are a European Union citizen, uh, you're an Estonian, you speak a language that no one understands, except for Finland sometimes, and you get, and you break a leg in Greece, you go to your doctor, you know, Heraklion, stick in your card, Put in your number, identifying the doctor sees your entire medical record already translated into Greek, and he says, "Oh, well, you have this allergy and this stuff, and it's all there for you." That is the kind of thing that you can do, which you can do it today. You could have done it 15 years ago. All of this stuff, stuff comes down to policy, law, and regulation, which basically have not been enacted. So that the positive story is there that you can do it. Please. Elena Demianenko, I'm just general public. Um, speaking about truth being uh, getting devalued, what's your uh, view on the uh, recently happened um, uh, march on science, if you have any? Well, I mean, I have a science background, so I, you know, I believe in... I'm an empiricist from, from an early age, so you, you know... Facts count. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's. Okay. I don't. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, what has allowed Western society to reach where it has reached is that um, you have you 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 have hypotheses. You have uh, and you test them and you look at how it matches up to empirical evidence. Basically, you're not. I mean, the you know, Daesh is or ISIS is not going to invent any technological wonder. The whole problem with anti-scientific movements, whatever they are, whatever theological or something else, is that uh, it, they don't work. You can use other people's technology, but you're not going to invent anything. Good. Yeah, please. Hi, John Holtz, Ray Spear, from, uh, retired from Livermore and from the uh, Hertz Foundation. About three or four years ago, I recall a group of uh, experts in computer science of all sorts those who had worked on uh, the DARPA, ARPANET, DARPANET, you know, <clears throat> probably five years older than I am, were, uh, gave uh, sort of a panel discussion down at San Jose at a AAAS meeting. And it was really very interesting because they, rather than talking about uh, software, they talked about the hardware from the, from the uh, net. And your comments about all of this stuff coming from Russia sort of caused me to rethink, think, that, think about that a little bit. After all, you're small enough with about 10 guys with some axes, you could sever those connections. And so, uh, and these folks began uh, some years ago, or actually sort of said, you know, there's an awful lot wrong with the way our internet is made <coughs> that would help and aid in correcting the problems that you mentioned. Uh, and it occurred to me whether uh, you're thinking about that or anybody else is thinking about that. But there were many, you know, things intrinsically wrong with the way messages are passed back and forth, you know, through the various uh, 
you know, what do you call it, collection points and all that kind of stuff that, that aid, aid the hacker? Well, perhaps. On the other hand, at least until recently, 90% of all internet traffic one way or another passed through the United States. I mean, so it ended up, I mean, at least that's what uh, Shane Harris claims in his book on... Yeah, but it still had to come back to Estonia through a cable, right, or a fiber or something. Yeah, no, but the point is that, um, I don't know, I mean, the thing is that the, it, it does, there are nodes, but as, for some reason the United States <laughs> is the biggest one. A, secondly, the internet was, in fact, was invented originally as something that, that in fact, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be that vulnerable because, uh, I mean, the original idea is that if, you're, if the U.S. is attacked by, as a nuclear bomb, then, well, then communications are, are not disrupted. I mean, that was the original idea. Uh, yeah, you can cut things off. The, are usually, the people, the only people I know who are sort of trying to do that are the Russians who are, seem to be going along cable routes between Europe and, uh, uh, Europe and the United States. I mean, exactly along where the Internet cables go, uh, for whatever reason. Um, I mean, if I were going to cut the Russians off or anything, it would be swift, rather. I mean, that's kind of the software side, the money transfer, rather than actually the hardware. Please. Uh, so my name is Ayn Huxley. I work for the Finnish Funding Agency for Innovation. Um, um, and my question is, um, when we consider cybersecurity, we usually consider it only as like a technical uh, something to do with our computers. But it seems like that is not the most critical part of it. Um, what what would happen if we considered uh, cybersecurity more from a psychological part, considering it uh, cybersecurity as like psychological security? Well, I don't know what that means. I mean, psychological security means you know you're not a neurotic, but um, <laughs> but I mean, uh, but as uh, for you know, paranoids actually may be right, um, and I, I mean, they are reading your mails. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, there are things in between. Certainly, in terms of cyber hygiene, uh, that's something everyone can do. And you should, uh, whenever you get one of the, if you ever get an email that says, you know, you're, you, know, you need to re-log in on this uh, on your bank account or or whatever it is, uh, just write write your name and password here. Always go up and see what the what who's sending it to. You. Click on the little thing because it may say Apple.com, but then you get. If you click on it, you see the real address, which is about this long, a bunch of numbers, and out of Italy. Um, then you know you're being spearfished. Um, but maybe thinking about in in a broader term of, of societal, um, how how can we secure uh, our society and, and psycho psychological? <laughs> well, I mean, if people believe in, uh, I mean. If, I mean, I don't know what to do. I mean, there. If you have, you know, info wars, uh, sort of talking about pedophile rings um, that don't exist, I and mean, people acting upon it with uh, automatic weapons, I don't know what you do for that. I mean, it's. I mean, to make people feel psychologically secure in the cyber age, I mean, there are people who just go offline, and then they don't have to worry about it. I mean, just go off the grid in general, but. Uh, I mean, this is just this is just part of what modern life is about. It, it, IT is is so uh, ubiquitous, and it's in such a big it's such a big part of our lives that um, that we I guess the only thing you can do is say you have to be aware that not everything is true, and uh, there are a lot of lies out there, and you, there are a lot of bad people who are, might do bad things to you online as opposed to in physical space. Can I add a build on this just for a minute in terms of the role of the government with security? Let's leave fake news out, out of it for a minute. So, you know, if, if soldiers crossed one of our physical borders, we expect our federal government to respond, right? That's, everybody would expect the state to do that. Uh, if somebody breaks into my house on campus, I call the government. I call 911. Uh, um, when, somebody, when I get that Gmail, uh, message, which I get frequently, uh, uh, somebody who's frequently attacked by a Russian government, and one time successfully when I was in the government, by the way, um, uh, uh, I call the IT guy. So tell me what's wrong, you know, what, what's your view of that? Like, when that happens to me, when I was in the government, by the way, most of it I can't talk about, but when I was in the government, the government came to my uh, 
it's called the FBI, uh, got involved and, by the way, detected that I was, uh, uh, that uh, one of my systems had been compromised and took immediate action. They showed up to my house on a Saturday uh, uh, to, to deal with that issue. Now that I'm not a government official, uh, I call the IT guy. Uh, what's, where does that go? Why, why is there not a demand? And the, and the same thing goes with the, the election in, in a more philosophical sense. That's why I wanted to get to it. Because, you know, obviously what happened in 2016 wasn't the equivalent of September 11th or December 7th, but it was a violation of our sovereignty. Uh, and you yourself in your talk said that it had an impact on the electoral outcome. Yet the role of the government in preventing that, in, you know, one of the things we think the government does is provide security, but somehow when it comes to these issues, we call the IT guy. Well, so what's, well, how there, will that change? Or should it change? Well, I mean, first of all, in fact, the FBI did notice that the DNC was hacked in August of 2015, and then they kept calling up the DNC to say, we'd like to come see you. Uh, and, they, and the DNC guy kept hanging up because there was a crank call. But just, just so, because I've been exactly in that situation, there's something fishy about that story. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the fact that people are using phones and leaving phone messages in and of itself doesn't feel like the 21st century. But, but uh, I'll address it more broadly. Okay. I mean, essentially, and this, is, this comes back to right now. When you cross, I mean, when you go across a national border, you go with a passport in which your government says you are you. When someone visits the United States and hasn't been to Iran, um, <laughs> he comes with a passport. That was a joke. I got it. Um, I, got it. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Um. Um, as a passport. And, you know, the Estonian government says this guy is this guy. We have no problem with that. And we've been using a passport system since basically the 1920s. It is the government guarantees your identity. Uh, right. Our problem in the internet is that we don't know who's who, except unless you have an identity like the Estonian ID card, which says you are you online. So you end up having, I'm saying the uh, sort of now you have a 3.5 billion people. That, I mean, there are 3.5 billion cars driving along this massive internet. Whatever, you know, Al Gore's term. Uh, uh, Highway, you know, super, super highway, information super highway, and only a few few of those cars actually have license plates on it, and all the other people are without license plates, and there are no sanctions; they can do anything they want. So, if you're one of the people with the, uh, the I mean, you want to have everyone with a license plate on their car, so you know who's doing what. Uh, and the issue then is how do you get that identity, and what is a trustworthy identity? Uh, in general, the passport is something which the government says you are you. You trust that it's a sovereign nation. Well, you can also have uh, you know a credit card, but maybe maybe not. Uh, does that really work? Um, you can have you can have a social security card, but that doesn't that's even government issue. But that doesn't really guarantee very much either. So you need to have some kind of sovereign authority saying you are you before you can proceed. And so I, I would say it does come down to. I mean, the role of the government should be to guarantee your identity. Now, if then there is a breach or something goes wrong in which it is a you they're using your government, well, so basically, some someone steals your passport, then you the police, you know, they go after that guy. Whereas if someone if someone steals your uh, you know, your uh, whatever um, Costco card that says you're you, it doesn't really. One way or another, so we have to get from Costco to right to. <laughs> Sounds like we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, the technology has advanced much farther. We don't really. It sounds like we don't know the norm, what the appropriate norms are, in terms of. I, I think your your point about identity is a good one. The point about when the government has a responsibility to defend you versus not. Um, you know, thinking of other. What, when the North Koreans also did tremendous da damage, when they did damage to Yahoo, uh, you know, if your if your property is damaged by a thief, to use your analogy, which is one I I like, there's liability to the thief. Yeah. Uh, not yet in the cyber world.
which is why we're glad that you're here to help us wrestle through this. So thank you all for coming.